Hello! Welcome to today's session on survey methods. As always, before we get started, please make sure that you have the PowerPoint lecture notes printed and in front of you so that you can take notes along the way and you can ask informed questions in class. To introduce and contextualize our discussion today on survey methods, we'll be talking a little bit about surveys and their relationship to correlational research, which we've talked about recently in our earlier videos. Then we'll talk about the important issue of sampling before we get to various kinds of survey methods specifically. Sampling will be an important introductory step before we can do our survey methods very effectively. So let's say a word or two first by understanding the comparison between surveys and correlational research. You'll see some, uh, some hearkening back to earlier conversations that we've had in this lecture series. So to put this into some context, let's begin with a couple of potential pop quiz questions. First, a review question, and that is, what were the four goals of the scientific method? We'll give you a moment, in, in just a moment, to stop the video and also address this second pop quiz question. Where would, you, where would survey research be placed among the four goals and why? So what were the four, four goals and then where do you think survey uh, methods and survey research would be placed? And we'll give you a moment to stop the video and respond to those questions. Okay, welcome back. Look forward to taking your responses to those questions in class. As we're getting started, we'll also remind ourselves about the research cycle, which as we've said several times, has these four very large boxes. The real world is what we're primarily interested in, and we're going to look at a particular psychological phenomenon from the real world whenever we're engaging in any methods, including, including survey methods. And we're going to abstract from that using operational definitions, which we'll be talking about shortly, and also sampling, which we'll be talking about shortly. And today we're going to be emphasizing survey methods as we pull out from our research representation different kinds of results. We've mentioned before that we could have observational methods here, and we've talked at great length about those. We had direct observational methods, and we had indirect observational methods, which might be such things as looking at historical records uh, indirectly. Uh, it might be the case that we can observe behavior more directly, uh, either by intervening with our participant or by looking from afar. If we are going to be intervening, we might have a script, we might not have a script. So lots of variation there in our observational methods. Today we're going to be approaching a new kind of methodology. We'll be talking about surveys, and then later on in this semester we'll be talking about experiments. Strictly speaking, you can use surveys even experimentally, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it in a few lectures. After we do or receive our research results, we'll engage in some data analysis as we've been doing in recent video lectures. We've talked a lot about correlational analyses. We talked about Spearman's row. We talked about the Pearson correlation coefficient as a couple of correlational statistics that we might use to generate some research conclusions that we hope will be able to generalize back to the real world psychological phenomena where we're going to be investigating some kind of behavior, thought, or feeling. Okay? All right. So there are two different uh, major approaches whenever we're talking about psychological research. We can talk about differential research, and we can talk about correlational research. So in differential research, we're typically looking at differences between groups, just as the name would suggest. We might be looking at the differences between some existing groups or some experimentally designed groups. These might be a control group and a group that's receiving some sort of therapy, as one example. It might be the case that we're looking, even within a group, at differences across particular conditions. Maybe we can have somebody who's receiving a placebo at time one, and then perhaps an experimental drug at time two. So we're looking at differences in certain kinds of research, but other times we're looking at mere correlations. Correlations are associations between variables, and a lot can be learned about behaviors thoughts and feelings, the science of psychology, by looking at each of these, differential research and correlational research. So um, surveys can actually pertain to both. You can use surveys in either of these categories. More frequently, we use them correlationally. And uh, it's important for prediction, as we've said. We can think of correlation and prediction as essentially interchangeable, and we'll be learning a fancy type of prediction called regression analysis as the semester moves on through. But uh, we just need to note for now that correlation is important for predicting, and that's one of our four goals. Okay, so some skeptics of survey research might make the following claim or ask the following question, do people really do what they say? 
So on a survey, we have people responding, if you will, by pencil and paper in the older world, and then more contemporarily, they're making their responses online, but they're still giving some kind of verbal indication of what they might be doing. And so the question becomes, is that really fair? Do they, do they accurately represent themselves? And if not, then maybe survey research isn't all that valuable. Okay? I'm interested in your opinions on that, on the relationship between what people would say, perhaps, in a survey about themselves, or perhaps about others, versus on what they actually do. Okay? So uh, this distinction between talking and walking, so to speak. Okay? Supporters of survey research would make the following claim, that surveys have a lot to offer even if surveys do not accurately assess behavior, and it might be the case that they do accurately assess behavior. But let's stipulate, just for the purpose of conversation, that surveys actually don't accurately assess behavior, would surveys have any other purpose? And supporters of survey research would point out that surveys can accurately assess attitudes and thoughts and beliefs. They can also assess feelings. So what we can say then is that even if there wasn't a direct correspondence between self-report on a survey and actual behavior, overt behavior, we still can assess attitudes, and attitudes, thoughts, and feelings are important aspects of psychology. So surveys are going to be playing a very important role in any kind of psychological research, or at least in much of psychological research. There's almost no topic uh, that is outside the bounds of survey research within psychology. Okay. So if you want to know what people are doing, observe them. This is what we talked about in the earlier portions of our course. We had entire lectures on observational methods that I alluded to earlier. If you want to know what people are thinking, it's perfectly reasonable to ask them, and this is where surveys come on board. So here we have some famous phrases from what you might know as uh, a very old game show called Family Feud, and the MC would say, survey says, and typically we're measuring attitudes. We might be able to measure behaviors as well, at least as indexed by self-report. Okay, so this brings us to a couple of more pop quiz questions, at least potential pop quiz questions. When might survey research give rise to ethical dilemmas? We'll have you think about that in just a moment. <clears throat> and then we'll ask you to think about some logical fallacies that might be related to this. So we'll give you a moment to stop the video and see if you can address this. When might survey research give rise to ethical dilemmas? Okay, welcome back. Hope you had a, a good response to that. Here's one kind of example that I think addresses this fairly well. And that is that sometimes when people are engaged in survey research, the ethical dilemma that might arise is what we might call a conflict of interest. This would not necessarily be limited to survey research, but because surveys are done so pervasively that it seems plausible to think that we could have this conflict of interest that is plaguing many of our survey research attempts. So let's give it a particular example of an ethical dilemma. It might be the case that, hypothetically, there is a cell phone company that obviously wants to sell phones because that's how they make their money. They might conduct some survey research, and they might ask questions in their surveys that go something like this. Do you believe that the use of cell phones helps you become a successful professional? And probably most people would endorse something like that, particularly if you've just put in some money into a cell phone usage. Uh, you might have some uh, cognitive dissonance working for you, and some of you might remember the idea of cognitive dissonance from intro to psych. In any case, you can imagine that a lot of people would at least self-report that cell phone usage, maybe particularly smartphone usage, makes them more successful professionally. So then, having acquired these survey data, the cell phone company might go on to advertise that their cell phones make you more professional. Okay? Now, what's interesting about this is that some folks might charge that there's an ethical dilemma here, that there is a conflict of interest, that the cell phone company actually has a profit motive in having us believe that. What I'd like to point out, though, is that that kind of skepticism in this particular case might be deemed a logical fallacy, and specifically, it might be called a fallacy of relevance. And there are different kinds of fallacies of relevance. In this cell phone case that we're entertaining right now, the particular kind of fallacy might be known as ad hominem, which way back when in the Latin translation would be the same as at the man. That is, the criticism is directed at the man. We can think in a less gendered way about how to translate that. We might think of it as at the person, or better still, at the messenger. 
Okay? So this criticism is directed at the messenger and not at the message. It might be the case that the cell phone company, for example, conducted a perfectly scientifically valid survey, and the fact that they happen to have a, final, a financial interest in the outcome does not in and of itself argue against the results from their survey. Now, if they had done something wrong in their survey, and maybe they inappropriately asked questions or they inappropriately managed the data, then we might have some disagreement with those survey results. But just by virtue of the fact that the cell phone company has an interest in the outcome, we can say there is a conflict of interest, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the survey results are incorrect or that they're, in, that they're invalid in some way. In other words, the relevance of the phone company's interest uh, does not necessarily um, uh, negate the finding that, that they have, that maybe the cell phone usage uh, really is helping people become better professionals. So what we can think of then is that there are two different varieties of ad hominem attacks. One is called ad hominem abusive and one is called ad hominem circumstantial. And we'll see if we can tie these back to something that you might recall from Intro to Psychology. Ad hominem abusive might take the form of something like this. My opponent is fill in the blank with some kind of negative trait. It might be my opponent is dishonest or my opponent is sneaky, uh, something along these lines. We're talking about a trait. We might call this from intro to psych a dispositional attribution. That is some trait about the opponent in this case or in our earlier example, some trait about the cell phone company uh, makes their claim unreliable. Okay? There again, we would be attacking the messenger and not the nature of the message. And in that way, we would say that this is a logical fallacy, that we really need to be addressing the validity of the message independent of any characteristic or trait that the messenger might have. There's another variation that you might imagine, ad hominem circumstantial. Okay, my opponent is conflicted. Okay, and that's probably a better description of what's going on here in the cell phone case. What we're suggesting here about the circumstantial ad hominem case is that uh, there is a conflict of interest to be sure, but that conflict of interest again is directed at the messenger. It doesn't necessarily negate the message. In fact, the messenger and the message are distinct phenomena and we'd be making a fallacy of relevance if we failed to make that distinction. We'd be committing a fallacy of relevance if we failed to make that distinction. Okay, so we can think about this as being more of a um, situational attribution rather than a dispositional attribution, as you might recall from what we learned about personality in Intro to Psych. Okay? So lots of interesting ethical issues arise when we're dealing with survey research, including the conflict of interest. Okay, survey research can be deceptively simple. You can imagine that even second and third graders could form a survey of some variety and they could probably survey each other. It's very easy to do uh, survey research poorly. Okay, we can put together something and call it a survey uh, that's unlike some other techniques that we have in psychology. Uh, for example, probably second graders and third graders can't assemble an MRI device. They probably can't assemble a galvanic skin device. Okay, but they probably can assemble an instrument that they would call a survey uh, because it's so easy to do, but it's easy to do poorly. Okay, one important issue pertains to sampling and we'll now transition into sampling. And I think you'll appreciate quite quickly that second and third graders would not be able to handle uh, cognitively most of the issues that arise when we're talking about doing sampling appropriately. Okay, so we'll move on to talk a little bit about sampling. And this diagram is just to remind us that as my voice is coming to you through this digital medium, it's actually being sampled. I have an analog voice. It's changing continuously in time, but you're actually hearing a sample of that, and this is how we'll begin to set the stage for our wider conversation on sampling. Okay, well, so we'll put sampling into context, and we'll start out again with a couple of pop quiz questions that are, again, for review, just so that we can connect some information from earlier in the semester to what we're doing here. So, what was time sampling, and can you generate your own example? And secondly, what was situation sampling and can you generate your own example? We'll give you a moment to stop the video and go from there. Okay, welcome back. Hope you have a confident answer to those pop quiz questions. Those were review. So here we are back again in our research cycle and as we've said several times, we have to move from the real world to something that's a little bit more manageable from a research perspective, a research representation, and we get 
from here to here through operational definitions and through sampling. So we've talked a little bit about sampling before, but now we're going to spend quite a bit of time so that we can set the stage well for the survey methods that are going to rely so heavily on how well we've been sampling. Okay? So we're going to introduce just a little bit of uh, terminology, and I hope that you will feel free to read in the textbook or to read on a wiki what the sampling frame is. We can think of the sampling frame as a list, and it's important to have that as a, a list of all members of a population. That is, every member of a group. Well, let's get to think about this. We'll see if we can have you connect this idea to operational definitions. And in case you can't read it on the video, I'll read this to you. What is meant by the statement that a sampling frame is essentially an operational definition of a population? We'll let you think about that for a moment. And then perhaps you can also generate a few examples of sampling frames. We'll let you stop the video and do that. Okay, welcome back. Now let's remind ourselves of what we mean by a sample. A sample is a subset of the overall population, and more specifically, it's a subset of the sampling frame. Okay? So we talked in our last slide about what the sampling frame is. If a sample is adequately to represent the population, the sampling frame must be appropriate. So we have to get that sampling frame right, or else we have no chance in having a successful sample. Each member of the population is called an element. Okay? So we can talk about the number of elements that we have in our, uh, in our sample, which will be, again, a subset of the sampling frame, which will most likely be a subset of the overall population. So sampling is about identifying and selecting elements uh, in, our, in our study. The external validity, and we've mentioned that before, the external validity of a study depends in part on the representativeness of a sample, and I think you'll see that representativeness is actually a quantitative construct, and we're dealing with a lot of quantitative reasoning in this course. A sample is representative, and here's something that's italicized, to the extent that it exhibits the same distribution of characteristics as the population. So we'll pause just for a moment here and remind us about some of the things we've been doing statistically recently. In this course, we have a combination of stats and research methods, and you might recall that we've been creating histograms, sometimes by drawing them manually, sometimes by generating them in SPSS. And in a histogram, we have frequency plotted on the y-axis or the ordinate, and on our abscissa, or x-axis, we have some variable of interest. And we might see something of a bell shape, we might see that a particular variable is skewed to the left or skewed to the right, whatever the case might be. Okay? We can think about how those variables are distributed and what their frequencies are, and then remind ourselves about this. A sample is representative to the extent that it exhibits the same distribution, as in a histogram, of characteristics as the population. So if we know something about the population characteristics, we can take a look at a particular sample, and we can actually make fairly precise quantitative statements about the extent to which our sample is matching the population on the relevant characteristics. It's perfectly reasonable if there's a mismatch there on irrelevant characteristics, but we can ask reasonable questions about uh, what are the relevant characteristics and to what extent is the sample matching the population. I hope that you'll begin to appreciate uh, this phrase. I, I know here, you can see it on your PowerPoint. It's uh, darkened here just a little bit, but we want to understand the subtlety in the phrase to the extent. So we don't ask questions like, is the sample representative of the population? We might ask, I think more appropriately, to what extent uh, is the sample representative of the population? That would be a really important way of thinking, because now we understand representativeness in the many shades of gray that it exists, rather than as an all-or-none kind of quantity. And good critical reasoners typically make that distinction. They see things, when appropriate, in the shades of gray, rather than in all-or-none kind of uh, all or none kinds of ways. Okay? The other idea that we ha might have here is that we might ask, in what sense is the sample representative to, uh, or similar to, the population? In what ways? So we can ask about this qualitatively, we can ask quantitatively by using the phrase, to what extent? Okay. So let's see if we can now uh, get a picture going that might give us a better appreciation for some of the vocabulary that we've been introducing. First, we're talking about the population of interest. Here's every member in the group of interest, and we can say, for example, that if we're at a particular college, maybe like Denison University, we're interested in a question like, to what extent people are satisfied with the food service that we might have on campus? 
and we might be interested in all 2,100 students on Denison University's campus, if that's, in fact, our population, our group of interest. So that's the population. And then we have to have a sampling frame, which we mentioned a little while ago, is essentially the operational definition of the population. So as one example, we might say that something like the sampling frame, or rather, we might say that the, that the registrar's list of students who are enrolled on the first day of class will constitute our sampling frame. And okay, that might be our operational definition. Now, to be fair, we understand that there might be a bit of a mismatch between the sampling frame and the overall population. It might be the case that there were some students whose name wasn't quite on the list on the first day of class. Maybe they arrived to campus later, or uh, whatever the case might be, there might have been a mismatch and the name just didn't get on there. Conversely, it might be that there were some students who started for uh, a couple of days at Denison, and then left the campus for whatever reason. Okay? So um, they would be on the sampling frame, but they wouldn't actually be a part of the population. So it, these are never perfect. Operational definitions are always working definitions. We state the operations that we use to define the construct. Here the construct might be something like the population of Denison University students. From the sampling frame, we're going to extract a sample, a subset of the sampling frame, just to make things a little bit more manageable. Okay? And then any particular observation that we have in that sample will be called our element, one member of the sampling frame. So here you can see hierarchically the population, the sample frame that operationally defines that, the sample that's going to be a subset of that, and then an element will just be one particular component of the sample. Hopefully that's uh, a clear hierarchical relationship that you can see. Okay, the representativeness of the sample can be threatened by something called a selection bias. So we need to be aware of what might be reducing the representativeness that we have. Because as you remember from our research cycle, when we get to our research conclusions, we're hoping that we can generalize those back to the real world. And our capacity to do that will depend in many ways on how representative our sample is. And that representativeness might be lessened if we in fact have a selection bias. So let's define selection bias as the overrepresentation or underrepresentation of some portion of the population caused by the procedures used to choose elements, okay, or to select elements. So I typically use the word choose here to avoid the circularity of saying select, but you can appreciate this distinction that we might have um, uh, made some bad choices about which elements we pulled off of our sampling frame. And maybe you can generate some uh, examples here. The one that I might uh, offer to you is that we can imagine that we are pulling people uh, from the sampling frame non-randomly. Maybe we're doing something called a convenience sample uh, rather than a purely random sample, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. Okay, let's talk a little bit about non-probability sampling, also called convenience sampling, as I mentioned a moment ago. Um, this does not guarantee that every element in a population has an equal chance of being included. Okay, so some elements have a greater chance of being included than do other elements. And when this is true, or to the extent this is true, then we have non-probability sampling. Okay? So here's a mantra that I'd like you to try to work with today, and hopefully this will stick throughout the semester and uh, on into future courses that you might take. Our mantra is, representative samples are better than large samples. Say it with me. Representative samples are better than large samples. Okay, so it's really all about representativeness. We'll see if we can give you an example. You might be familiar with this. There was one study that looked at the issue of representativeness, and the question was relating to surveys that have been conducted on an important issue about the location of the United Nations. So as many of you know, the United Nations is located and headquartered in the United States, and some people think that's very appropriate. Others think that it would be better to follow a model more like that of the Olympics where every so many years, the Olympics will move to another nation. And as it moves from nation to nation, continent to continent, there is a sense that the Olympics is not owned by any one country or any one continent, but rather it's really of the entire human population. And some people have thought that maybe that would be a good thing also for the UN. It's really not just a United States idea. It should be broader than that. So to get at this, the researchers who are intrigued by this question wanted to conduct a survey and they conducted the survey a couple of different ways. On the one hand, there was a show that was a television show that was politically oriented, and a lot of the folks who are very interested in politics would be tuning into that show. 
and they put up a telephone number that could be called and you could chime in and respond to a couple of survey questions by way of telephone. And it turns out that of the maybe few million people who are watching, 186,000 people um, dialed in on the telephone and responded to the survey questions okay, about where uh, the UN should be. The question was basically, should it be kept in the US or should it be uh, moved around to other countries? Now, uh, that was the response from that particular television show, which had a political orientation to it. A different survey with exactly the same questions had been taken on 500 randomly selected Americans. Some of those folks might have been watchers of this television show. Many of them probably weren't. But these were now random, and their characteristics matched those of the overall U.S. population uh, very, very well. What was interesting was we got wildly different responses from these two different samples. In this case, when we had 186,000 people uh, who were all tuned into the show, there was a strong feeling, in fact, a vast majority thought it would be best to move the UN from country to country across the years. By contrast, when you randomly sample and representatively sample the citizens of the US, there was a pretty strong feeling that the UN should reside inside of the United States. Okay, so we got very different kinds of outcomes based on who was being sampled. Obviously, this is a much larger sample. It's also much less representative because most Americans wouldn't be watching that show and most Americans uh, would have perhaps different views than those folks who self-selected into watching that show. So we're back to our mantra, representative samples are better than large samples. Okay, okay. we'll move on from here and we'll talk a little bit about probability sampling in contrast to the non-probability sampling that we saw a moment ago. So this is a procedure for ensuring that each member of a population has an equal chance of being chosen in the sample, and obviously this is preferred. It tends to increase our representativeness. When probability sampling is used, the researcher can state the probability that any given element will be used in the sample. Let's go back to an example I gave just a moment ago when I talked about Denison University and its interest in learning about how the student population feels about the food services. We'll assume that we have 2,100 students here at Denison, and if it is the case that we're using probability sampling and we're doing that correctly, then we can state with confidence that any given element in our population has a probability of being selected into our study of exactly 1 over 2,100. Okay? To the extent that we can assert that confidently, then we can say that we've got probability sampling. On the other hand, if we're going to engage in non-probability sampling or convenience sampling, then it might be the case that we really don't know what the probability of any given element is. We'll go back just for a moment and talk a little bit about non-probability sampling. We could conduct our survey perhaps by standing outside of the library at maybe 8.45 in the morning and we can ask whoever happens to walk by how they feel about food services. The reason that would be non-probability sampling also known as convenience sampling is that some students couldn't be walking by because they're in 8.30 classes. So at 8.45, if you and I are standing outside of the library and we're administering this survey, we are definitionally missing some of the students who are signed up for 8.30 classes. There's another population that we might be missing, or another subgroup that we might be missing, and that might be the many students who prefer to sleep in a bit and start taking their classes much later in the morning, or even to have only afternoon classes. Those folks would not be up at 8.45. So we're missing large fractions of the population if we were to engage in this convenience sampling and we have a better chance of capturing all of the folks and getting a very representative uh, sample if we engage instead in uh, probability sampling. Okay? All right. So let's consider two types of probability sampling. We know that uh, we should be able to state the probability of any given element. In the example that we're using so far, we have one out of 2,100 if we're engaged in probability sampling. Uh, let's go to first simple random sampling. And this is stated as every element has an equal chance of being included in the sample. And this is really no different from the overall general definition of probability sampling. It's one and the same. We can think of a uh, simple random sampling as probability sampling. So the steps here might be quite straightforward. We might number each element of the sampling frame. Our sampling frame a moment ago was the registrar's list on the first day of classes. We might have 2,100 students there. And they might be numbered uh, from 1 to 2,100. <clears throat> there might be some other kind of identifying number. We might decide on the sample size. I might arbitrarily say I want 10% of the population randomly chosen. So that would give me now 
uh, 210 students as my sample size. We'll have some rule for random number generation. We might use, as we'll see in a moment, Excel's random number table or random number generator. We have random number tables in the back of most statistical textbooks. So we can figure out how we want to randomly generate the number and then we'll start pulling names from the list which is the registrar's sampling frame in this case. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so random number tables and we'll see the appendix are not easy to develop. Um, it takes a long time to figure out how to put these together. Now, the list of numbers is said to be random only if two conditions are, are satisfied. And we'll spend just a little bit of time on this probability theory and random number theory. The first idea is that the different components of the list have to be equally probable. After many trials, no one number should be observed significantly more often than any other number. So if we take the, the simple counting numbers of 1 through 9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let's say we have a system or a computer that randomly generates those numbers. After we do this several hundred times or even several thousand times, we should have about as many 5s as we have 8s and about as many 8s as 4s. We shouldn't see a significant difference in the frequency of any one of those elements. They should be occurring with equal probability. Okay. Secondarily, we can talk about the independence. There should be no pattern in the data. Random number lists have no memory, where recently observed numbers are less likely than numbers that are due or haven't been observed for a while. So if I were to count the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and repeat that time and time again, if my random number generator did that, I would have equal probability, but I wouldn't have independence. We would be able to predict what the next random number is. And we shouldn't be able to do that if, in fact, any given random number is independent from all the other randomly generated numbers. Okay. Humans, as it turns out, are, um, are pretty bad at generating random numbers. If you walk up to a person and you ask them to start generating random numbers, they typically can do this fairly well. Uh, they will typically give you roughly equal probability. Okay. But what they do is they tend to violate the independence assumption. Um, they're less inclined, for example, to create repeated numbers uh, if you ask them to generate sequences of arbitrary heads and tails, uh, they will toggle back and forth between heads and tails a little bit too frequently relative to what an actual coin flip would do. An actual coin flip will frequently give you strings of heads and strings of tails, and people tend to avoid that when they're generating their own random outcomes. So we typically are bad because of this independence assumption, interestingly enough. Okay, let's take a moment just to remind you of how to generate these things inside of Excel. So we're going to use a command that will be called the equals rand command, and then we'll hit the F9 key, and I'll call that up over here. Okay. So that syntax again will look like this, equals rand, and then we open a left paren uh, and immediately close it with a right paren. It doesn't take any information in there. And once we do that, we'll be retrieving now numbers between 0 and 1. Here's one of them. And every time we hit the F9 key, we get a brand new number. And if I hold down the F9 key, you can see the numbers go flying on by. So we can use a random number table, or we can use Excel to generate these. Uh, we can, of course, um, pull this down or pull this over that formula, and we can now get uh, columns or rows or tables inside of Excel that are uh, purely random. The programmers for Microsoft really do a nice job in getting random numbers going. They know all about the independence assumption. They know all about equal probability. Uh, these are uh, well-represented random numbers. Okay, let's talk about other kinds of sampling. The second type of probability sampling is called stratified sampling, and I'll read this definition for you. A procedure for dividing populations into subgroups, then drawing random samples from each stratum. So we can call these subgroups by their plural name, which is strata, and then the singular version of that would be uh, a stratum. You might draw either equal samples uh, from the stratum, or you might scale the sample size of each stratum based on its proportion in the population. So we have equal size versus proportional size when we're talking about this uh, stratified sampling. And we'll see if you can generate an example of each of these, and then I'll come back and give you an example, because sometimes students have trouble with this. We'll see if we can have you stop the video and generate your own example. OK, welcome back. Um, so the example that I like to give is one that's based on the US government's uh, representation. 
uh, how Congress is constructed. As you might know, Congress in the U.S. has an upper house that we call the Senate and a lower house that we call the House of Representatives. And it turns out that we use an equal sized kind of sample in the House, uh, excuse me, in the, uh, in the Senate, and we used a proportional or a scaled sample size uh, in the lower house, which is the, the House of Representatives. So let's go back to the Senate just for a moment and remind us that we have 50 states currently in the United States. That number could change. But currently we have 50 states in the United States, and we have two senators from each of those states. Now, some of you might know, by size and by population, the state of California is a lot bigger than the state of Rhode Island. Despite that, we have exactly two senators from Rhode Island, and we have exactly two senators from California. So each state, no matter how large or small, gets the same number of samples, in this case it's two, for the U.S. Senate. We can contrast that with the lower house, which we call the House of Representatives, and that now has a scaled sample size. So it might be that there is something like a 53 to 1 representation of California versus Rhode Island. California's population might be approximately 53 times as large as that of, of Rhode Island, and so we're going to have many more representatives from California uh, than we would from Rhode Island. Okay, So you can do this either of two ways. In general, stratified sampling can, but doesn't have to, increase representativeness. But if you think that it does for your particular research question, then this would be another tool for you to have in your toolbox. The decision about whether to use equal uh, versus proportional sample sizes, equal again was kind of like the Senate, every state gets two, proportional would be like our House of Representatives. We get representation um, that is proportional or uh, commensurate with just how large our population is. Uh, it depends on uh, the question that you want to answer. You might think about this, what is your desired unit of analysis? If you're really comparing one state to another state, or maybe an ensemble of states to another ensemble of states, maybe the state is your unit of analysis. On the other hand, it might be that the general voting population is your unit of analysis. So uh, depending on the nature of your question, this might uh, guide whether you're going to be using an equal sample size or a proportional sample size in your, your stratified sampling. Okay, let's see if we can now have a pop quiz question that might um, help us pull some of these ideas together. Generate your own hypothetical example of a study here at Denison or on your campus, wherever that might be, that would exemplify non-probability sampling, and then explain how that study could be altered to exemplify probability sampling. We'll give you a moment to stop the video and see if you can respond to this question. Okay, welcome back. In the classroom, we'll spend quite a bit of time on this slide, which I think uh, students through the years have found to be very helpful. What we're going to do is play something like a match game, and we alluded to match game earlier. For each population shown here on the left, and we have four different populations, we're going to try to find the matching representative sample on this side, where we have A, B, C, and D. Okay, so given the information in here, uh, one of these uniquely matches to that, and it does take a little bit of computation, but it's only about ratios right, and percentages. So we're going to ask you to think about the percentages that are stipulated here and find their match over on this side. If you'd like to give that a go now, you can feel free to do that and stop the video. I'm going to go ahead and proceed so that we can spend a little time on this in, in class. Here's an interesting and important question. How large does the sample need to be? Okay. This is something that you'll be grappling with uh, whenever you're conducting your own research. And this also would extend beyond just survey methods, but certainly for survey methods, we can ask, how large does the sample need to be? The answer depends in part on the homogeneity of your population. Okay? And this means how similar the members of the population are to each other, particularly on the relevant variable. Okay? And so we can unpack it this way. Homogeneous populations require relatively small samples to achieve representativeness. I'll come back to an example in just a moment. Heterogeneous populations, that's one where there's a lot of variability, require relatively large samples to achieve representativeness. So let's go back to this homogeneous case, and I can share with you some of my own research. I am a psychophysicist, that is, I'm a perceptual psychologist, and I'm very interested in how sensory systems work. Uh, this branch of psychology is called psychophysics. It turns out that although no two people have exactly the same visual system, there's a lot of similarity from one person to the next in how the visual system works. We all have photoreceptors. 
Almost all of us have two eyes. The pupillary reflex works the same way. We see approximately over the same range of wavelengths. Some people see a more narrow range by a few nanometers, others a wider range, but generally we're quite homogeneous in how the eye works and how the eye connects to the occipital lobe. There are some differences, but generally speaking we're all pretty similar on that. Folks who are wealthy and folks who are less wealthy have very similar kinds of visual systems. Folks who are politically liberal and politically conservative, how, however different they might be on their political views, they actually have visual systems that work in very similar manners. So as a psychophysicist or perceptual psychologist, it doesn't really matter to me whether I'm dealing with somebody who is wealthy or not so wealthy, liberal or more conservative. Um, their visual systems operate in largely the same way. As a matter of fact, a lot of mammals have very similar visual systems, and primates have extremely similar uh, visual systems. So I have a relatively homogeneous group that I'm working with, so I can probably get away with quite small samples. By contrast, if we think about other things that we might want to measure as psychologists, uh, then the heterogeneity of the population becomes a little bit more apparent. People have wildly different views on what tastes good, uh, what kinds of snacks are spicy, which ones are too sweet, too salty. Uh, people have wildly different views on what kinds of um, political moves a country should make and what kinds of public policies should be adopted. Uh, very different views on that. So we're probably going to need a much larger population to capture all the variability uh, in contrast to what would be the case if we had a more homogeneous population. Okay, so um, that's our introduction to sampling and there are a lot of ideas there. Why don't we give you a moment to stop the video and make a note of what was clear to you and also what was less clear. Okay, welcome back. We're now going to proceed, having set the stage for uh, probability sampling or with probability sampling and non-probability sampling, we'll now talk a little bit about different kinds of survey methods. And we'll have four methods in general. You can see that sometimes these tend to run a little bit one into the next. There might be variations, but these are the, the four general survey methods. Mail surveys, personal interviews, telephone interviews, and internet surveys. Okay, so we'll, we'll see that there are pros and cons associated with each of these, and uh, the various pros and cons might inform you as to which you would like to use given the nature of your particular study. So we'll start out with mail surveys, self-administered questionnaires that respondents fill out on their own. This could include email. More typically, it's been done through snail mail or paper mail, as we, we sometimes say, but this can be done through email also. There are a few advantages associated with doing this. The experimenter bias is eliminated. So you are not physically present when the person is filling out the, uh, the mail survey. So there's no chance of you biasing them when they're beginning to respond. That's clearly uh, a nice advantage. The researcher bias is, is eliminated. Embarrassing topics can be addressed anonymously. Sometimes psychologists do talk about sensitive issues that relate to very personal behaviors, thoughts, or feelings. And if that information had to be collected live, you might imagine that there could be some hesitation on the part of the respondent. Uh, so we can avoid all of that by um, doing this through the mail or maybe through the internet. Uh, data can be obtained from multiple participants simultaneously, and it's really exciting to think about how um, uh, how effective that is in terms of time usage. Instead of running one participant at a time, you can send out a large stack of surveys, and in principle, hundreds of thousands or even millions of people can be responding simultaneously. And so that's a lot of data, more than you could plausibly collect in person. So lots of advantages with the mail survey. Usually, we maintain anonymity in a mail survey by having some kind of a code. Uh, that will allow us to understand that this um, item had been mailed to a particular region of the country uh, and it allows us to track the information even though we're not necessarily interested in any particular participant's name or their personal information, uh, identifying information, we're just interested maybe in their, um, in their ideas. One disadvantage associated with mail surveys, as you might guess, we typically have very, very low response rates, sometimes 30% or worse. Uh, and this suggests a possible response bias. So earlier we talked about a selection bias, okay, and how the selection bias might have threatened representativeness. Now we have a cousin of sorts to that. We might call this a response rate bias, the threat to representativeness that arises when not all respondents complete the survey. Only the squeaky wheels respond. 
So it might be the case that you very diligently went through your sampling frame and you used a random number generator and you got a very random sample as a selection, okay? But now you have a response rate bias problem that not everybody is responding and it might be that only a certain section is responding and that might threaten the representativeness. So let's think about this. How does the concept of response rate bias differ from the concept of demand characteristics? You might recall that when we talked about observational methods, we addressed the issue of demand characteristics. Now that we're talking about survey methods, we'll ask about response rate bias, and we'll see if we can distinguish those two from each other. Secondly, you might consider this. How does the concept of response rate bias differ from the concept of expectancy effects? Again, we mentioned expectancy effects when we described observational methods. So we'll let you muse about this for a moment, and I'll go on for now. As we previously discussed, the burden of proof is on the experimenter who must establish that there is no significant response bias. So typically, you're going to be trying to make a case that you have a relationship between two variables, or that you have maybe even a cause and effect kind of relationship, not just an association. The burden of proof is on you as the researcher, and so a fair question that a reviewer might ask of you is, how do you know that your, or, or to what extent, might you say that your sample is representative of the population, okay? And the burden of proof is on you. You should have a good, preferably quantitative answer for the variables of interest. Okay, here's a potential pop quiz question. What are some suggestions for boosting response rates? We'll let you think about that, and our text and the internet probably has some really good suggestions about that. So what are some suggestions for boosting the response rate? We'll let you pause the video, Okay, let's go on and talk a little bit about the next type of survey method. This is personal interviews, a procedure in which data are obtained one-on-one, -on -one, or maybe one-on-a few, in person. Okay, so this is going on in real time, and uh, there are some advantages of this. Uh, for the personal interviews, we can say that the researchers can clarify questions for participants. That really can't be done on a mail survey. The question is, canned, so to speak, out it goes. If it's poorly phrased or if there's an ambiguity in the respondent's um, uh, way of thinking about it, there can be no clarification there. If you're there live, you can help to clarify what something might mean. So that's clearly an advantage. Researchers can uh, clarify the participant's response. So not only can we clarify what we meant by a question, but maybe you get back an ambiguous answer. And if you get that on a mail survey, it's too late. You, you'll have no way of correcting that or, or um, disambiguating that, I should say. Okay? So you can clarify the response if you're there live. The response rates tend to be higher for personal interviews than for mail surveys. On mail surveys, it's fairly common for people to just omit their response to several items because they're careless or um, they're disinterested or they just happen to miss it or they don't want to respond. They're much more likely to give a response to each of the personal interviewers' questions or items than they would in a mail survey. So there are several advantages associated with personal interviews. Um, there are some disadvantages. Obviously, this is a huge time sink for the researchers. Uh, you're collecting all of these one at a time rather than maybe tens of thousands or even millions at a time. So this is a relatively time-intensive process. There is the potential for researcher bias. Uh, that is, that it might be that even though you don't believe yourself to be biased, you're recording things in a biased manner. Uh, that could have been avoided had we used a mail survey. And there's a potential for researcher inconsistency. Whenever there's more than one researcher in a lab group, it might be the case that researcher A and researcher B follow slightly different procedures, uh, even though they're not supposed to. Maybe they're not doing it intentionally. Uh, but uh, there is this problem of inter-rater reliability in the observational world. This can happen also during interviews. Okay, let's move on to telephone interviews, which you can imagine, probably many of you have done telephone interviews in some form, or you've, you've completed a survey by way of telephone. In recent years, telephone survey researchers have had to guard against a relatively new problem, which is that certain portions of the population might have more than one phone number. I have, I think, three phone numbers. I have my office phone, I have a cell phone uh, that I, I use at my home, but I also have a cell phone that I keep with me when I'm traveling. So I'm one person and I have three telephone numbers. It might be that there are some folks who have more telephone numbers than that, but maybe several folks have fewer telephone numbers. So if you now have a list of all the telephone numbers in an area code, I'm represented three times and somebody else might be represented once. Okay? So this is an important 
uh, idea when we're thinking about the representativeness of our survey methods if we're using telephone interviews. Here's a really interesting one from the history of survey research. What was a fatal flaw in the process of telephone interviews when telephones were first introduced? And this would be, uh, maybe they were becoming very popular in the 1930s and quite popular in the 1940s. Um, here's a little clue for you. This is President Harry Truman holding up a false headline that says, Dewey defeats Truman. Okay, so uh, I wonder if you can hearken back to whatever you might have learned from history, uh, history class about this particular event, and think about what might have gone wrong in the survey methods here. It would be a fun conversation to have in class. Okay, there are a couple of advantages associated with phone surveys. Random phone number selection is automated. Okay, so we can, we can have a computer generate these numbers for us quite quickly. Dangerous areas can be sampled without harm to the researcher. You really do want to get perhaps lots of different groups, and some of those groups are more accessible than others. Some of the groups might be in areas that you wouldn't want to travel to for any number of reasons. And this is a way of sampling the good folks in those difficult areas while, without putting the researcher at any kind of risk. Uh, there are also some disadvantages. As before, as was the case for the live interview, we can have researcher bias. There might be a sample bias. Only some people are willing to be interrupted. Generally speaking, I'm not willing to be interrupted uh, for, for telephone interviews. So that creates a skew now in the population response. Um, people may respond differently to faceless voices than they would if they were there in person. So lots of issues to consider here. Okay, let's move on to internet surveys, uh, which you've probably completed. Internet surveys have many advantages. Uh, they're very, very low cost, and they're getting even cheaper. Potential for huge samples, and that number is likely to grow. Um, they're green. We don't have to spend uh, postage or paper as we're, we're sending out the uh, the surveys, as would have been the case for, uh, for the mail surveys, and we have access to underrepresented samples. So um, people might be folks with special diets, like vegans, for example. Okay? So it might be the case that uh, vegans are relatively hard to find, but through the internet they might be clustered somewhere. There might be vegan sites, and you might be able to access them more readily on the internet than you could if you were trying to do this by, by mail, for example. Obviously, there are some disadvantages here. You can have a response rate bias. Uh, it might be the case that some folks are extremely enthusiastic responders. You probably see this in your Facebook posts. There are some of your friends who post all the time about even seemingly trivial things. There are other folks who post more judiciously, maybe less frequently, and they're more thoughtful in their posts, and you might have some friends that post not at all. So we get huge response rate biases uh, when we're dealing with internet-based phenomena. A selection bias, not everybody is on the internet. Okay? And there's lack of control over the participant's environment. So in a personal interview, you might have somebody come into your laboratory, and you can control exactly what the setting is. Um, we can't really be sure what's going on when we're getting a response uh, on the internet, and it even might be the case that we think we're getting a response from one person, when in fact it might be an ensemble of people who are taking turns at a computer terminal. So uh, lots of questions are raised there. One last note about surveys. It's important to remember that we are not interested in any particular respondent uh, or sample. What we're really interested in is what the population can tell us. And we have to go through samples and through individuals that we call elements in order to gain information about the population. And this is one of the things that is most frequently understood about survey methods and people who have less training in science. Uh, sometimes people are concerned that there's going to be a privacy violation, and that, that can be a legitimate concern. But actually, the researcher is less interested in any particular identity. We're interested in what the population is doing. And we go through the sample and the sampling frame and the various elements to get to that population-based question. So that was a lot of information. This has been one of our longer videos. Thanks for making it to the end. I hope that, as always, you'll make a note of what was particularly clear and what kinds of things can be clarified in class. See you in class.